Section 1 of the State of the Union Addresses, 1849 to 1856. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Zachary Taylor, December 4th, 1849. Part 1. Fellow Citizens of the Senate and House of Representatives, Sixty years have elapsed since the establishment of this government, and the Congress of the United States again assembles to legislate for an empire of free men. The predictions of evil prophets who formerly pretended to foretell the downfall of our institutions are now remembered only to be derided, and the United States of America, at this moment, present to the world the most stable and permanent government on earth. Such is the result of the labors of those who have gone before us. Upon Congress will eminently depend the future maintenance of our system of free government and the transmission of it unimpaired to posterity. We are at peace with all the other nations of the world and seek to maintain our cherished relations of amity with them. During the past year we have been blessed by a kind providence with an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and although the destroying angel for a time visited extensive portions of our territory with the ravages of a dreadful pestilence, yet the Almighty has at length deigned to stay his hand and to restore the inestimable blessing of general health to a people who have acknowledged his power, deprecated his wrath, and implored his merciful protection. While enjoying the benefits of amicable intercourse with foreign nations, we have not been insensible to the distractions and wars which have prevailed in other quarters of the world. It is a proper theme of thanksgiving to him who rules the destinies of nations that we have been able to maintain amidst all these contests an independent and neutral position toward all belligerent powers. Our relations with Great Britain are of the most friendly character. In consequence of the recent alteration of the British Navigation Acts, British vessels from British and other foreign ports will, under our existing laws, after the first day of January next, be admitted to entry in our ports, with cargoes of the growth, manufacture, or production of any part of the world, on the same terms, as to duties, imposts, and charges, as vessels of the United States with their cargoes, and our vessels, will be admitted to the same advantages in British ports, entering therein on the same terms as British vessels. Should no order in council disturb this legislative arrangement, the late act of the British Parliament, by which Great Britain is brought within the terms proposed by the Act of Congress of the 1st of March, 1817, it is hoped, will be productive of benefit to both countries. A slight interruption of diplomatic intercourse, which occurred between this government and France, I am happy to say, has been terminated, and our minister there has been received. It is therefore unnecessary to refer now to the circumstances which led to that interruption. I need not express to you the sincere satisfaction with which we shall welcome the arrival of another envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary from a sister republic to which we have so long been and still remain bound by the strongest ties of amity shortly after i entered upon the discharge of the executive duties i was apprised that a war steamer belonging to the german empire was being fitted out in the harbors of new york with the aid of some of our naval officers rendered under the permission of the late secretary of the navy this permission was granted during an armistice between that empire and the kingdom of denmark which had been engaged in the schleswig-holstein war apprehensive that this act of intervention on our part might be viewed as a violation of our neutral obligations incurred by the treaty with denmark and of the provisions of the act of congress of the twentieth of april eighteen eighteen i directed that no further aid should be rendered by any agent or officer of the navy and I instructed the Secretary of State to apprise the Minister of the German Empire, accredited to this government, of my determination to execute the law of the United States and to maintain the faith of treaties with all nations. The correspondence which ensued between the Department of State and the Minister of the German Empire is herewith laid before you. The execution of the law 
and the observance of the treaty were deemed by me to be due to the honor of the country as well as to the sacred obligations of the constitution i shall not fail to pursue the same course should a similar case arise with any other nation having avowed the opinion on taking the oath of office that in disputes between conflicting foreign governments it is our interest not less than our duty to remain strictly neutral i shall not abandon it you will perceive from the correspondence submitted to you in connection with this subject that the course adopted in this case has been properly regarded by the belligerent powers interested in the matter although a minister of the united states to the german empire was appointed by my predecessor in august eighteen forty eight and has for a long time been in attendance at frankfurt on the main and although a minister appointed to represent that empire was received and accredited here yet no such government as that of the german empire has been definitively constituted mr donelson our representative at frankfurt remained there several months in the expectation that a union of the german states under one constitution or form of government might at length be organized it is believed by those well acquainted with the existing relations between prussia and the states of germany that no such union can be permanently established without her cooperation in the event of the formation of such a union and the organization of a central power in germany of which she should form a part it would become necessary to withdraw our minister at berlin but while prussia exists as an independent kingdom and diplomatic relations are maintained with her there can be no necessity for the continuance of the mission to frankfurt i have therefore recalled mr donelson and directed the archives of the legation at frankfurt to be transferred to the american legation at berlin having been apprised that a considerable number of adventurers were engaged in fitting out a military expedition within the united states against a foreign country and believing from the best information i could obtain that it was destined to invade the island of cuba i deemed it due to the friendly relations existing between the united states and spain to the treaty between the two nations to the laws of the united states and above all to the american honor to exert the lawful authority of this government in suppressing the expedition and preventing the invasion to this end i issued a proclamation enjoining it upon the officers of the united states civil and military to use all lawful means within their power a copy of that proclamation is herewith submitted the expedition has been suppressed so long as the act of congress of the twentieth of april eighteen eighteen which owes its existence to the law of nations and to the policy of washington himself shall remain on our statute books i hold it to be the duty of the executive faithfully to obey its injunctions while this expedition was in progress i was informed that a foreigner who claimed our protection had been clandestinely and as was supposed forcibly carried off in a vessel from new orleans to the island of cuba i immediately caused such steps to be taken as i thought necessary in case the information i had received should prove correct to vindicate the honor of the country and the right of every person seeking asylum on our soil to the protection of our laws the person alleged to have been abducted was promptly restored and the circumstances of the case are now about to undergo investigation before a judicial tribunal i would respectfully suggest that although the crime charged to have been committed in this case is held odious as being in conflict with our opinions on the subject of national sovereignty and personal freedom there is no prohibition of it or punishment for it provided in any act of congress the expediency of supplying this defect in our criminal code is therefore recommended to your consideration i have scrupulously avoided any interference in the wars and contentions which have recently distracted europe during the late conflict between austria and hungary there seemed to be a prospect that the latter might become an independent nation however faint that prospect at the time appeared i thought it my duty in accordance with the general sentiment of the american people who deeply sympathized with the magyar patriots to stand prepared upon the contingency of the establishment by her of a permanent government to be the first to welcome independent hungary 
into the family of nations. For this purpose I invested an agent, then in Europe, with power to declare our willingness promptly to recognize her independence in the event of her ability to sustain it. The powerful intervention of Russia in the contest extinguished the hopes of the struggling Magyars. The United States did not at any time interfere in the contest, but the feelings of the nation were strongly enlisted in the cause, and by the sufferings of a brave people who had made a gallant, though unsuccessful, effort to be free. Our claims upon Portugal have been, during the past year, prosecuted with renewed vigor, and it has been my object to employ every effort of honorable diplomacy to procure their adjustment. Our late charge d'affaires at Lisbon, the Honorable George W. Hopkins, made able and energetic but unsuccessful efforts to settle these unpleasant matters of controversy and to obtain indemnity for the wrongs which were the subjects of complaint. Our present charge d'affaires at that court will also bring to the prosecution of these claims ability and zeal. The revolutionary and distracted condition of Portugal in past times has been represented as one of the leading causes of her delay in indemnifying our suffering citizens. But I must now say it is a matter of profound regret that these claims have not yet been settled. The omission of Portugal to do justice to the American claimants has now assumed a character so grave and serious that I shall shortly make it the subject of a special message to Congress, with a view to such ultimate action as its wisdom and patriotism may suggest. With Russia, Austria, Prussia, Sweden, Denmark, Belgium, the Netherlands, and the Italian states, we still maintain our accustomed amicable relations. During the recent revolutions in the Papal States, our charge d'affaires at Rome has been unable to present his letter of credence, which, indeed, he was directed by my predecessor to withhold until he should receive further orders. Such was the unsettled condition of things in those states that it was not deemed expedient to give him any instructions on the subject of presenting his credential letter different from those with which he had been furnished by the late administration until the 25th of June last, when, in consequence of the want of accurate information of the exact state of things at that distance from us, he was instructed to exercise his own discretion in presenting himself to the then existing government if in his judgment sufficiently stable or if not to await further events since that period rome has undergone another revolution and he abides the establishment of a government sufficiently permanent to justify him in opening diplomatic intercourse with it with the Republic of Mexico, it is our true policy to cultivate the most friendly relations. Since the ratification of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, nothing has occurred of a serious character to disturb them. A faithful observance of the treaty and a sincere respect for her rights cannot fail to secure the lasting confidence and friendship of that Republic. The message of my predecessor to the House of Representatives on the 8th of February last, communicating in compliance with a resolution of that body, a copy of a paper called a protocol, signed at Queretaro on the 30th of May, 1848, by the Commissioners of the United States and the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Mexican Government, having been a subject of correspondence between the Department of State and the envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary of that republic accredited to this government, a transcript of that correspondence is herewith submitted. The commissioner on the part of the United States for marking the boundary between the two republics, though delayed in reaching San Diego by unforeseen obstacles, arrived at that place within a short period after the time required by the treaty, and was there joined by the commissioner on the part of Mexico. They entered upon their duties, and at the date of the latest intelligence from that quarter, some progress had been made in the survey. The expenses incident to the organization of the commission, and to its conveyance to the point where its operations were to begin, have so much reduced the fund appropriated by Congress, that a further sum to cover the charges which must be incurred during the present fiscal year will be necessary. The great length of frontier along which the boundary extends, the nature of the adjacent territory, 
and the difficulty of obtaining supplies except at or near the extremes of the line render it also indispensable that a liberal provision should be made to meet the necessary charges during the fiscal year ending on the 30th of June, 1851. I accordingly recommend this subject to your attention. In the adjustment of the claims of American citizens on Mexico provided for by the late treaty, the employment of counsel on the part of the government may become important for the purpose of assisting the commissioners in protecting the interests of the United States. I recommend this subject to the early and favorable consideration of Congress. Complaints have been made in regard to the inefficiency of the means provided by the government of New Granada for transporting the United States mail across the Isthmus of Panama, pursuant to our postal convention with that republic, on the 6th of March, 1844. Our charge d'affaires at Bogota has been directed to make such representations to the government of New Granada, as will, it is hoped, lead to a prompt removal of this cause of complaint. The sanguinary civil war with which the Republic of Venezuela has for some time been ravaged has been brought to a close. In its progress, the rights of some of our citizens, resident or trading there, have been violated. The restoration of order will afford the Venezuelan government an opportunity to examine and redress these grievances, and others of longer standing, which our representatives at Caracas have hitherto ineffectually urged upon the attention of that government. The extension of the coast of the United States on the Pacific, and the unexampled rapidity with which the inhabitants of California especially are increasing in numbers, have imparted new consequence to our relations with the other countries whose territories border upon that ocean. It is probable that the intercourse between those countries and our possessions in that quarter, particularly with the Republic of Chile, will become extensive and mutually advantageous, in proportion as California and Oregon shall increase in population and wealth. It is desirable, therefore, that this government should do everything in its power to foster and strengthen its relations with those states, and that the spirit of amity between us should be mutual and cordial. I recommend the observance of the same course toward all other American states. The United States stand as the great American power, to which, as their natural ally and friend, they will always be disposed first to look for mediation and assistance, in the event of any collision between them and any European nation. As such, we may often kindly mediate in their behalf, without entangling ourselves in foreign wars or unnecessary controversies. Whenever the faith of our treaties with any of them shall require our interference, we must necessarily interpose. A convention has been negotiated with Brazil, providing for the satisfaction of American claims on that government, and it will be submitted to the Senate. Since the last session of Congress, we have received an envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary from that empire, and our relations with it are grounded upon the most amicable understanding. Your attention is earnestly invited to an amendment of our existing laws relating to the African slave trade, with a view to the effectual suppression of that barbarous traffic. It is not to be denied that this trade is still in part carried on by means of vessels built in the United States, and owned or navigated by some of our citizens. The correspondence between the Department of State and the Minister and Consul of the United States at Rio de Janeiro, which has from time to time been laid before Congress, represents that it is a customary device to evade the penalties of our laws by means of sea letters. Vessels sold in Brazil, when provided with such papers by the consul, instead of returning to the United States for a new register, proceed at once to the coast of Africa for the purpose of obtaining cargoes of slaves. Much additional information of the same character has recently been transmitted to the Department of State. It has not been considered the policy of our laws to subject an American citizen who in a foreign country purchases a vessel built in the United States to the inconvenience of sending her home for a new register before permitting her to proceed on a voyage. Any alteration of the laws which might have a tendency to impede the free transfer of property in vessels between our citizens, or the free navigation of those vessels between different parts of the world, 
when employed in lawful commerce, should be well and cautiously considered. But I trust that your wisdom will devise a method by which our general policy in this respect may be preserved, and at the same time the abuse of our flag by means of sea letters in the manner indicated may be prevented. Having ascertained that there is no prospect of the reunion of the five states of Central America, which formerly composed the Republic of that name, we have separately negotiated with some of them treaties of amity and commerce, which will be laid before the Senate. A contract having been concluded with the state of Nicaragua by a company composed of American citizens for the purpose of constructing a ship canal through the territory of that state to connect the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, I have directed the negotiation of a treaty with Nicaragua, pledging both governments to protect those who shall engage in and perfect the work. All other nations are invited by the state of Nicaragua to enter into the same treaty stipulations with her, and the benefit to be derived by each from such an arrangement will be the protection of this great interoceanic communication against any power which might seek to obstruct it or to monopolize its advantages. All states entering into such a treaty will enjoy the right of passage through the canal on the payment of the same tolls. The work, if constructed under these guarantees, will become a bond of peace instead of a subject of contention and strife between the nations of the earth. Should the great maritime states of Europe consent to this arrangement, and we have no reason to suppose that a proposition so fair and honorable will be opposed by any, the energies of their people and ours will cooperate in promoting the success of the enterprise. I do not recommend any appropriation from the national treasury for this purpose, nor do I believe that such an appropriation is necessary. Private enterprise, if properly protected, will complete the work, should it prove to be feasible. The parties who have procured the charter from Nicaragua for its construction desire no assistance from this government beyond its protection, and they profess that, having examined the proposed line of communication, they will be ready to commence the undertaking whenever that protection shall be extended to them. Should there appear to be reason, on examining the whole evidence, to entertain a serious doubt of the practicability of constructing such a canal, that doubt could be speedily solved by an actual exploration of the route. Should such a work be constructed under the common protection of all nations, for equal benefits to all, it would be neither just nor expedient that any great maritime state should command the communication. The territory through which the canal may be opened ought to be freed from the claims of any foreign power. No such power should occupy a position that would enable it hereafter to exercise so controlling an influence over the commerce of the world, or to obstruct a highway which ought to be dedicated to the common uses of mankind. The routes across the isthmus at Tehuantepec and Panama are also worthy of our serious consideration. They did not fail to engage the attention of my predecessor. The negotiator of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was instructed to offer a very large sum of money for the right of transit across the isthmus of Tehuantepec. The Mexican government did not accede to the proposition for the purchase of the right-of-way, probably because it had already contracted with private individuals for the construction of a passage from the Guasacualco River to Tehuantepec. I shall not renew any proposition to purchase for money, a right which ought to be equally secured to all nations, on payment of a reasonable toll to the owners of the improvement, who would, doubtless, be well contented with that compensation and the guarantees of the maritime states of the world in separate treaties negotiated with Mexico, binding her and them to protect those who should construct the work. Such guarantees would do more to secure the completion of the communication through the territory of Mexico than any other reasonable consideration that could be offered, and as Mexico herself would be the greatest gainer by the opening of this communication between the Gulf and the Pacific Ocean, it is presumed that she would not hesitate to yield her aid in the manner proposed to accomplish an improvement so important to her own best interests. We have reason to hope that the proposed railroad across the isthmus at Panama will be successfully constructed under the protection of the late treaty with New Granada, ratified and exchanged by my predecessor on the 10th day of June, 1848, 
which guarantees the perfect neutrality of the Isthmus and the rights of sovereignty and property of New Granada over that territory, with a view that the free transit from ocean to ocean may not be interrupted or embarrassed during the existence of the treaty. It is our policy to encourage every practicable route across the Isthmus which connects North and South America, either by railroad or canal, which the energy and enterprise of our citizens may induce them to complete, and I consider it obligatory upon me to adopt that policy, especially in consequence of the absolute necessity of facilitating intercourse with our possessions on the Pacific. The position of the Sandwich Islands, with reference to the territory of the United States on the Pacific, the success of our persevering and benevolent citizens who have repaired to that remote quarter in Christianizing the natives and inducing them to adopt a system of government and laws suited to their capacity and wants, and the use made by our numerous whale ships of the harbors of the islands as places of resort for obtaining refreshments and repairs, all combine to render their destiny peculiarly interesting to us. It is our duty to encourage the authorities of those islands in their efforts to improve and elevate the moral and political condition of the inhabitants, and we should make reasonable allowances for the difficulties inseparable from this task. We desire that the islands may maintain their independence, and that other nations should concur with us in this sentiment. We could in no event be indifferent to their passing under the dominion of any other power. The principal commercial states have in this a common interest, and it is to be hoped that no one of them will attempt to interpose obstacles to the entire independence of the islands. End of section one. Recording by Owen Cook in Potawatomi Ceded Land. Section two of State of the Union Addresses, 1849 to 1856. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Zachary Taylor, December 4th, 1849, Part 2. The receipts into the Treasury for the fiscal year ending on the 30th of June last were, in cash, $48,830,097.50, and in Treasury notes funded $10,833,000, making an aggregate of $59,663,097.50. And the expenditures for the same time were, in cash, $46,798,667.82, and in Treasury notes funded, $10,833,000, making an aggregate of $57,631,667.82. The accounts and estimates which will be submitted to Congress in the report of the Secretary of the Treasury show that there will probably be a deficit occasioned by the expenses of the Mexican War and Treaty on the first day of July next of $5,828,121.66, and on the first day of July 1851, of $10,547,092.73 making in the whole a probable deficit to be provided for of $16,375,214.39. The extraordinary expenses of the war with Mexico and the purchase of California and New Mexico exceed in amount this deficit together with the loans heretofore made for those objects. I therefore recommend that authority be given to borrow whatever sum may be necessary to cover that deficit. I recommend the observance of strict economy in the appropriation and expenditure of public money. I recommend a revision of the existing tariff and its adjustment on a basis which may augment the revenue. I do not doubt the right or duty of Congress to encourage domestic industry, which is the great source of national as well as individual wealth and prosperity. I look to the wisdom and patriotism of Congress for the adoption of a system which may place home labor at last on a sure and permanent footing, and by due encouragement of manufactures, give a new and increased stimulus to agriculture, 
and promote the development of our vast resources and the extension of our commerce. Believing that to the attainment of these ends, as well as the necessary augmentation of the revenue and the prevention of frauds, a system of specific duties is best adapted, I strongly recommend to Congress the adoption of that system, fixing the duties at rates high enough to afford substantial and sufficient encouragement to our own industry, and at the same time so adjusted as to ensure stability. The question of the continuance of the sub-treasury system is respectfully submitted to the wisdom of Congress. If continued, important modifications of it appear to be indispensable. For further details and views on the above and other matters connected with commerce, the finances, and revenue, I refer to the report of the Secretary of the Treasury. No direct aid has been given by the general government to the improvement of agriculture, except by the expenditure of small sums for the collection and publication of agricultural statistics, and for some chemical analyses which have been thus far paid out of the patent fund. This aid is, in my opinion, wholly inadequate. To give this leading branch of American industry the encouragement which it merits, I respectfully recommend the establishment of an agricultural bureau to be connected with the Department of the Interior. To elevate the social condition of the agriculturist, to increase his prosperity, and to extend his means of usefulness to his country by multiplying his sources of information, should be the study of every statesman, and a primary object with every legislator. No civil government having been provided by Congress for California, the people of that territory, impelled by the necessities of their political condition, recently met in convention for the purpose of forming a constitution and state government, which the latest advices give me reason to suppose has been accomplished, and it is believed they will shortly apply for the admission of California into the Union as a sovereign state. Should such be the case, and should their constitution be conformable to the requisitions of the Constitution of the United States, I recommend their application to the favorable consideration of Congress. The people of New Mexico will also, it is believed, at no very distant period, present themselves for admission into the Union. Preparatory to the admission of California and New Mexico, the people of each will have instituted for themselves a Republican form of government, laying its foundation in such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. By awaiting their action, all causes of uneasiness may be avoided and confidence and kind feeling preserved. With a view of maintaining the harmony and tranquility so dear to all, we should abstain from the introduction of those exciting topics of a sectional character, which have hitherto produced painful apprehensions in the public mind. And I repeat the solemn warning of the first and most illustrious of my predecessors against furnishing any ground for characterizing parties by geographical discriminations. A collector has been appointed at San Francisco under the Act of Congress extending the revenue laws over California, and measures have been taken to organize the custom houses at that and the other ports mentioned in that act at the earliest period practicable. The collector proceeded overland, and advices have not yet been received of his arrival at San Francisco. Meanwhile, it is understood that the customs have continued to be collected there by officers acting under the military authority, as they were during the administration of my predecessor. It will, I think, be expedient to confirm the collections thus made, and direct the avails, after such allowances as Congress may think fit to authorize, to be expended within the territory, or to be paid into the Treasury for the purpose of meeting appropriations for the improvement of its rivers and harbors. A party engaged on the Coast Survey was dispatched to Oregon in January last. According to the latest advices, they had not left California and directions have been given to them, as soon as they shall have fixed on the sites of the two lighthouses and the buoys authorized to be constructed and placed in Oregon, to proceed without delay to make reconnaissance of the most important points on the coast of California, and especially to examine and determine on sites for lighthouses on that coast, the speedy erection of which is urgently demanded by our rapidly increasing commerce. 
I have transferred the Indian agencies from Upper Missouri and Council Bluffs to Santa Fe and Salt Lake, and have caused to be appointed sub-agents in the valleys of the Gila, the Sacramento, and the San Joaquin Rivers. Still further legal provisions will be necessary for the effective and successful extension of our system of Indian intercourse over the new territories. I recommend the establishment of a branch mint in California, as it will, in my opinion, afford important facilities to those engaged in mining, as well as to the government in the disposition of the mineral lands. I also recommend that commissions be organized by Congress to examine and decide upon the validity of the present subsisting land titles in California and New Mexico, and that provision be made for the establishment of offices of surveyor general in New Mexico, California, and Oregon, and for the surveying and bringing to market the public lands in those territories. Those lands, remote in position and difficult of access, ought to be disposed of on terms liberal to all, but especially favorable to the early emigrants. In order that the situation and character of the principal mineral deposits in California may be ascertained, I recommend that a geological and mineralogical exploration be connected with the linear surveys, and that the mineral lands be divided into small lots suitable for mining, and be disposed of by sale or lease, so as to give our citizens an opportunity of procuring a permanent right of property in the soil. This would seem to be as important to the success of mining as of agricultural pursuits. The great mineral wealth of California and the advantages which its ports and harbors and those of Oregon afford to commerce, especially with the islands of the Pacific and Indian Oceans and the populous regions of Eastern Asia, make it certain that there will arise in a few years large and prosperous communities on our western coast. It therefore becomes important that a line of communication, the best and most expeditious which the nature of the country will admit, should be opened within the territory of the United States, from the navigable waters of the Atlantic or the Gulf of Mexico to the Pacific. Opinion as elicited and expressed by two large and respectable conventions lately assembled at St. Louis and Memphis points to a railroad as that which, if practicable, will best meet the wishes and wants of the country. But while this, if in successful operation, would be a work of great national importance, and of a value to the country which it would be difficult to estimate, it ought also to be regarded as an undertaking of vast magnitude and expense, and one which must, if it indeed be practicable, encounter many difficulties in its construction and use. Therefore, to avoid failure and disappointment, to enable Congress to judge whether in the condition of the country through which it must pass the work be feasible, and, if it found to be so, whether it should be undertaken as a national improvement, or left to individual enterprise, and in the latter alternative what aid, if any, ought to be extended to it by the government, I recommend, as a preliminary measure, a careful reconnaissance of the several proposed routes by a scientific corps, and a report as to the practicability of making such a road, with an estimate to the cost of its construction and support. For further views on these and other matters connected with the duties of the Home Department, I refer you to the report of the Secretary of the Interior. I recommend early appropriations for continuing the river and harbor improvements which have been already begun, and also for the construction of those for which estimates have been made, as well as for examinations and estimates preparatory to the commencement of such others as the wants of the country, and especially the advance of our population over new districts and the extension of commerce, may render necessary. An estimate of the amount which can be advantageously expended within the next fiscal year under the direction of the Bureau of Topographical Engineers, accompanies the report of the Secretary of War, to which I respectfully invite the attention of Congress. The cession of territory made by the late treaty with Mexico has greatly extended our exposed frontier and rendered its defense more difficult. That treaty has also brought us under obligations to Mexico, to comply with which a military force is requisite but our military establishment is not materially changed as to its efficiency from the condition in which it stood before the commencement of the Mexican War. 
Some addition to it will therefore be necessary, and I recommend to the favorable consideration of Congress an increase of the several corps of the Army at our distant western posts, as proposed in the accompanying report of the Secretary of War. Great embarrassment has resulted from the effect upon rank in the Army heretofore given to brevet and staff commissions. The views of the Secretary of War on this subject are deemed important, and, if carried into effect, will, it is believed, promote the harmony of the service. A plan proposed for retiring disabled officers, and providing an asylum for such of the rank and file, as from age, wounds, and other infirmities occasioned by service, have become unfit to perform their respective duties, is recommended as a means of increasing the efficiency of the army, and as an act of justice, due from a grateful country, to the faithful soldier. The accompanying report of the Secretary of the Navy presents a full and satisfactory account of the condition and operations of the naval service during the past year. Our citizens engaged in the legitimate pursuits of commerce have enjoyed its benefits. Wherever our national vessels have gone, they have been received with respect, our officers have been treated with kindness and courtesy and they have on all occasions pursued a course of strict neutrality in accordance with the policy of our government. The naval force at present in commission is as large as is admissible with the number of men authorized by Congress to be employed. I invite your attention to the recommendation of the Secretary of the Navy on the subject of a reorganization of the Navy in its various grades of officers, and the establishment of a retired list for such of the officers as are disqualified for active and effective service. Should Congress adopt some such measure as is recommended, it will greatly increase the efficiency of the Navy and reduce its expenditures. I also ask your attention to the views expressed by him in reference to the employment of war steamers, and in regard to the contracts for the transportation of the United States mails and the operation of the system upon the prosperity of the Navy. By an act of Congress, passed August 14, 1848, provision was made for extending post office and mail accommodations to California and Oregon. Exertions have been made to execute that law, but the limited provisions of the act, the inadequacy of the means it authorizes, the ill adaptation of our post office laws to the situation of that country, and the measure of compensation for services allowed by those laws, compared with the prices of labor and rents in California, render those exertions in a great degree ineffectual. More particular and efficient provision by law is required on this subject. The Act of 1845 reducing postage has now, by its operation during four years, produced results fully showing that the income from such reduced postage is sufficient to sustain the whole expense of the service of the Post Office Department, not including the cost of transportation and mail steamers on the lines from New York to Chagres, and from Panama to Astoria, which have not been considered by Congress as properly belonging to the mail service. It is submitted to the wisdom of Congress whether a further reduction of postage should not now be made, particularly on the letter correspondence. This should be relieved from the unjust burden of transporting and delivering the franked matter of Congress, for which public service provision should be made from the Treasury. I confidently believe that a change may safely be made, reducing all single letter postage to the uniform rate of five cents, regardless of distance, without thereby imposing any greater tax on the Treasury than would constitute a very moderate compensation for this public service, and I therefore respectfully recommend such a reduction. Should Congress prefer to abolish the franking privilege entirely, it seems probable that no demand on the Treasury would result from the proposed reduction of postage. Whether any further diminution should now be made, or the result of the reduction to five cents which I have recommended should first be tested, is submitted to your decision. Since the commencement of the last session of Congress, a postal treaty with Great Britain has been received and ratified and such relations have been formed by the post office departments of the two countries in pursuance of that treaty as to carry its provisions into full operation the attempt to extend this same arrangement through england to france has not been equally successful but the purpose has not been abandoned 
for a particular statement of the condition of the post office department and other matters connected with that branch of the public service i refer you to the report of the postmaster general by the act of the third of march eighteen forty nine a board was constituted to make arrangements for taking the seventh census composed of the secretary of state the attorney general and the postmaster general and it was made the duty of this board to prepare and cause to be printed such forms and schedules as might be necessary for the full enumeration of the inhabitants of the united states and also proper forms and schedules for collecting in statistical tables under proper heads such information as to mines agriculture commerce manufactures education and other topics as would exhibit a full view of the pursuits industry education and resources of the country the duties enjoined upon the census board thus established having been performed it now rests with congress to enact a law for carrying into effect the provision of the constitution which requires an actual enumeration of the people of the united states within the ensuing year among the duties assigned by the constitution to the general government is one of local and limited application but not on that account the less obligatory I allude to the trust committed to Congress as the exclusive legislator and sole guardian of the interests of the District of Columbia. I beg to commend these interests to your kind attention. As the national metropolis, the city of Washington must be an object of general interest, and found it as it was under the auspices of him whose immortal name it bears. Its claims to the fostering care of Congress present themselves with additional strength. Whatever can contribute to its prosperity must enlist the feelings of its constitutional guardians and command their favorable consideration. Our government is one of limited powers, and its successful administration eminently depends on the confinement of each of its coordinate branches within its own appropriate sphere. The first section of the Constitution ordains that all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. The Executive has authority to recommend, not to dictate, measures to Congress. Having performed that duty, the Executive Department of the Government cannot rightfully control the decision of Congress on any subject of legislation until that decision shall have been officially submitted to the President for approval. The check provided by the Constitution in the clause conferring the qualified veto will never be exercised by me except in the cases contemplated by the Fathers of the Republic. I view it as an extreme measure to be resorted to only in extraordinary cases, as where it may become necessary to defend the executive against the encroachments of the legislative power, or to prevent hasty and inconsiderate or unconstitutional legislation. By cautiously confining this remedy within the sphere prescribed to it in the contemporaneous expositions of the framers of the Constitution, the will of the people, legitimately expressed on all subjects of legislation through their constitutional organs the senators and representatives of the united states will have its full effect as indispensable to the preservation of our system of self-government the independence of the representatives of the states and the people is guaranteed by the constitution and they owe no responsibility to any human power but their constituents by holding the representative responsible only to the people and exempting him from all other influences, we elevate the character of the constituent, and quicken his sense of responsibility to his country. It is under these circumstances only that the elector can feel that, in the choice of the lawmaker, he is himself truly a component part of the sovereign power of the nation. With equal care we should study to defend the rights of the executive and judicial departments. Our government can only be preserved in its purity by the suppression and entire elimination of every claim or tendency of one coordinate branch to encroachment upon another. With a strict observance of this rule and the other injunctions of the Constitution, with a sedulous inculcation of that respect and love for the union of the states which our fathers cherished and enjoined upon their children, and with the aid of that overruling providence which has so long and so kindly guarded our liberties and institutions, 
we may reasonably expect to transmit them with their innumerable blessings to the remotest posterity. But attachment to the union of the states should be habitually fostered in every American heart. For more than half a century, during which kingdoms and empires have fallen, this union has stood unshaken. The patriots who formed it have long since descended to the grave, yet still it remains, the proudest monument to their memory, and the object of affection and admiration with everyone worthy to bear the American name. In my judgment, its dissolution would be the greatest of calamities, and to avert that should be the study of every American. Upon its preservation must depend our own happiness and that of countless generations to come. Whatever dangers may threaten it, I shall stand by it and maintain it in its integrity to the full extent of the obligations imposed and the powers conferred upon me by the Constitution. Z. Taylor End of Section 2 Recording by Owen Cook in Pottawatomie Ceded Land Section 3 of the State of the Union Addresses, 1849-1856. to This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. State of the Union Address. Millard Fillmore. December 2nd, 1850. Part 1. Fellow Citizens of the Senate, and of the House of Representatives. Being suddenly called, in the midst of the last session of Congress, by a painful dispensation of divine providence, to the responsible station which I now hold, I contented myself with such communications to the legislature as the exigency of the moment seemed to require. The country was shrouded in mourning for the loss of its venerable chief magistrate, and all hearts were penetrated with grief. Neither the time nor the occasion appeared to require or to justify on my part any general expression of political opinions or any announcement of the principles which would govern me in the discharge of the duties to the performance of which I had been so unexpectedly called. I trust, therefore, that it may not be deemed inappropriate if i avail myself of this opportunity of the reassembling of congress to make known my sentiments in a general manner in regard to the policy which ought to be pursued by the government both in its intercourse with foreign nations and its management and administration of internal affairs nations like individuals in a state of nature are equal and independent, possessing certain rights and owing certain duties to each other arising from their necessary and unavoidable relations, which rights and duties there is no common human authority to protect and enforce. Still, they are rights and duties binding in morals, in conscience, and in honor although there is no tribunal to which an injured party can appeal but the disinterested judgment of mankind and ultimately the arbitrament of the sword among the acknowledged rights of nations is that which each possesses of establishing that form of government which it may deem most conducive to the happiness and prosperity of its own citizens of changing that form as circumstances may require, and of managing its internal affairs according to its own will. The people of the United States claim this right for themselves, and they readily concede it to others. Hence it becomes an imperative duty not to interfere in the government or internal policy of other nations. And although we may sympathize with the unfortunate or the oppressed everywhere, in their struggles for freedom, our principles forbid us from taking any part in such foreign contests. We make no wars to promote or to prevent successions to thrones, to maintain any theory of a balance of power, or to suppress the actual government which any country chooses to establish for itself. 
we instigate no revolutions nor suffer any hostile military expeditions to be fitted out in the united states to invade the territory or provinces of a friendly nation the great law of morality ought to have a national as well as a personal and individual application we should act toward other nations as we wish them to act towards us and justice and conscience should form the rule of conduct between governments instead of mere power self-interest or the desire of aggrandizement to maintain a strict neutrality in foreign wars to cultivate friendly relations to reciprocate every noble and generous act and to perform punctually and scrupulously every treaty obligation these are the duties which we owe to other states and by the performance of which we best entitle ourselves to like treatment from them or if that in any case be refused we can enforce our own rights with justice and a clear conscience in our domestic policy the constitution will be my guide and in questions of doubt i shall look for its interpretation to the judicial decisions of that tribunal which was established to expound it and to the usage of the government sanctioned by the acquiescence of the country i regard all its provisions as equally binding in all its parts it is the will of the people expressed in the most solemn form and the constituted authorities are but agents to carry that will into effect every power which it has granted is to be exercised for the public good but no pretense of utility no honest conviction even of what might be expedient can justify the assumption of any power not granted the powers conferred upon the government and their distribution to the several departments are as clearly expressed in that sacred instrument as the imperfection of human language will allow and i deem it my first duty not to question its wisdom add to its provisions evade its requirements or nullify its commands upon you fellow citizens as the representatives of the states and the people is wisely devolved the legislative power i shall comply with my duty in laying before you from time to time any information calculated to enable you to discharge your high and responsible trust for the benefit of our common constituents my opinions will be frankly expressed upon the leading subjects of legislation and if which i do not anticipate any act should pass the two houses of congress which should appear to me unconstitutional or an encroachment on the just powers of other departments or with provisions hastily adopted and likely to produce consequences injurious and unforeseen i should not shrink from the duty of returning it to you with my reasons for your further consideration beyond the due performance of these constitutional obligations both my respect for the legislature and my sense of propriety will restrain me from any attempt to control or influence your proceedings with you is the power the honor and the responsibility of the legislation of the country the government of the united states is a limited government it is confined to the exercise of powers expressly granted and such others as may be necessary for carrying those powers into effect and it is at all times in a special duty to guard against any infringement on the just rights of the states over the objects and subjects entrusted to congress its legislative authority is supreme but here that authority ceases 
and every citizen who truly loves the constitution and desires the continuance of its existence and its blessings will resolutely and firmly resist any interference in those domestic affairs which the constitution has dearly and unequivocally left to the exclusive authority of the states and every such citizen will also deprecate useless irritation among the several members of the union and all reproach and crimination tending to alienate one portion of the country from another the beauty of our system of government consists and its safety and durability must consist in avoiding mutual collisions and encroachments and in the regular separate action of all while each is revolving in its own distinct orbit the constitution has made it the duty of the president to take care that the laws be faithfully executed in a government like ours in which all laws are passed by a majority of the representatives of the people and these representatives are chosen for such short periods that any injurious or obnoxious law can very soon be repealed it would appear unlikely that any great numbers should be found ready to resist the execution of the laws but it must be borne in mind that the country is extensive that there may be local interests or prejudices rendering a law odious in one part which is not so in another and that the thoughtless and inconsiderate misled by their passions or their imaginations may be induced madly to resist such laws as they disapprove such persons should recollect that without law there can be no real practical liberty that when law is trampled under foot tyranny rules whether it appears in the form of a military despotism or of a popular violence the law is the only sure protection of the weak and the only efficient restraint upon the strong when impartially and faithfully administered none is beneath its protection and none above its control you gentlemen and the country may be assured that to the utmost of my ability and to the extent of the power vested in me i shall at all times and in all places take care that the laws be faithfully executed in the discharge of this duty solemnly imposed upon me by the constitution and by my oath of office i shall shrink from no responsibility and shall endeavor to meet events as they may arise with firmness as well as with prudence and discretion the appointing power is one of the most delicate with which the executive is invested i regard it as a sacred trust to be exercised with the sole view of advancing the prosperity and happiness of the people it shall be my effort to elevate the standard of official employment by selecting for places of importance individuals fitted for the posts to which they are assigned by their known integrity talents and virtues in so extensive a country with so great a population and where few persons appointed to office can be known to the appointing power mistakes will sometimes unavoidably happen and unfortunate appointments be made notwithstanding the greatest care in such cases the power of removal may be properly exercised and neglect of duty or malfeasance in office will be no more tolerated in individuals appointed by myself than in those appointed by others i am happy in being able to say that no unfavorable change in our foreign relations has taken place since the message at the opening of the last session of congress we are at peace with all nations and we enjoy in imminent degree the blessings of that peace in a prosperous and growing commerce and in all the forms of amicable national intercourse the unexampled growth of the country the present amount of its population and its ample means of self-protection assure for it the respect of all nations 
while it is trusted that its character for justice and a regard to the rights of other states will cause that respect to be readily and cheerfully paid a convention was negotiated between the united states and great britain in april last for facilitating and protecting the construction of a ship canal between the atlantic and pacific oceans and for other purposes the instrument has since been ratified by the contracting parties the exchange of ratifications has been effected and proclamation thereof has been duly made in addition to the stipulations contained in this convention two other objects remain to be accomplished between the contracting powers first the designation and establishment of a free port at each end of the canal second an agreement fixing the distance from the shore with which belligerent maritime operations shall not be carried on on these points there is little doubt that the two governments will come to an understanding the company of citizens of the united states who have acquired from the state of nicaragua the privilege of constructing a ship canal between the two oceans through the territory of that state have made progress in their preliminary arrangements the treaty between the united states and great britain of the nineteenth of april last above referred to being now in operation is to be hoped that the guarantees which it offers will be sufficient to secure the completion of the work with all practicable expedition it is obvious that this result would be indefinitely postponed if any other than peaceful measures for the purpose of harmonizing conflicting claims to territory in that quarter should be adopted it will consequently be my endeavor to cause any further negotiations on the part of this government which may be requisite for this purpose to be so conducted as to bring them to a speedy and successful close some unavoidable delay has occurred arising from distance and the difficulty of intercourse between this government and that of nicaragua but as intelligence has just been received of the appointment of an envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary of that government to reside at washington whose arrival may soon be expected it is hoped that no further impediments will be experienced in the prompt transaction of business between the two governments citizens of the united states have undertaken the connection of the two oceans by means of a railroad across the isthmus of tehuantepec under grants of the mexican government to a citizen of that republic it is understood that a thorough survey of the course of the communications is in preparation and there is every reason to expect that it will be prosecuted with characteristic energy especially when that government shall have consented to such stipulations with the government of the united states as may be necessary to impart a feeling of security to those who may embark their prosperity in the enterprise negotiations are pending for the accomplishment of that object and a hope is confidently entertained that when the government of mexico shall become duly sensible of the advantages which that country cannot fail to derive from the work and learn that the government of the united states desires that the right of sovereignty of mexico in the isthmus shall remain unimpaired the stipulations referred to will be agreed to with alacrity by the last advices from mexico it would appear, however, that the government entertains strong objections to some of the stipulations which the parties concerned in the project of the railroad deem necessary for their protection and security. Further consideration, it is to be hoped, or some modification of terms may yet reconcile the differences existing between the two governments in this respect fresh instructions have recently been given to the minister of the united states in mexico who is prosecuting the subject with promptitude and ability although the negotiations with portugal for the payment of claims of citizens of the united states against that government have not yet resulted in a formal treaty yet a proposition made by the government of portugal for the final adjustment and payment of those claims has recently been accepted on the part of the united states it gives me pleasure to say that mr clay 
to whom the negotiation on the part of the united states has been entrusted discharge the duties of his appointment with ability and discretion acting always within the instructions of his government it is expected that a regular convention will be immediately negotiated for carrying the agreement between the two governments into effect the commissioner appointed under the act of congress for carrying into effect the convention with brazil of the twenty seventh of january eighteen forty nine has entered upon the performance of his duties imposed upon him by that act it is hoped that those duties may be completed within the time which it prescribes the documents however which the imperial government by the third article of the convention stipulates to furnish to the government of the united states has not yet been received as it is presumed that those documents will be essential for the correct disposition of the claims it may become necessary for congress to extend the period limited for the duration of the commission the sum stipulated by the fourth article of the convention to be paid to this government has been received the collection in the ports of the united states of discriminating duties upon the vessels of chile and their cargoes has been suspended pursuant to the provisions of the act of congress of the twenty fourth of may eighteen twenty eight it is to be hoped that this measure will impart a fresh impulse to the commerce between the two countries which of late and especially since our acquisition of california has to the mutual advantage of the parties been much augmented peruvian guano has become so desirable an article to the agricultural interest of the united states that it is the duty of the government to employ all the means properly in its power for the purpose of causing that article to be imported into the country at a reasonable price nothing will be omitted on my part toward accomplishing this desirable end i am persuaded that in removing any restraints on this traffic the peruvian government will promote its own best interests while it will afford a proof of a friendly disposition towards this country which will be duly appreciated the treaty between the united states and his majesty the king of the hawaiian islands which has recently been made public will it is believed have a beneficial effect upon the relations between the two countries the relations between those parts of the island of st domingo which were formerly colonies of spain and france respectively are still in an unsettled condition the proximity of that island to the united states and the delicate questions involved in the existing controversy there render it desirable that it should be permanently and speedily adjusted the interests of humanity and of general commerce also demand this and as intimations of the same sentiment have been received from other governments it is hoped that some plan may soon be devised to effect the object in a manner likely to give general satisfaction the government of the united states will not fail by the exercise of all proper friendly offices to do all in its power to put an end to the destructive war which has raged between the different parts of the island and to secure to them both the benefits of peace and commerce i refer you to the report of the secretary of the treasury for a detailed statement of the finances the total receipts into the treasury for the year ending the thirtieth of june last were forty seven million four hundred and twenty one thousand seven hundred and forty eight dollars and ninety cents the total expenditures during the same period were forty three million two thousand one hundred and sixty eight dollars and ninety cents the public debt has been reduced since the last annual report from the treasury department four hundred and ninety five thousand two hundred and seventy six dollars and seventy nine cents by the nineteenth section of the act of twenty eighth january eighteen forty seven the proceeds of the sales of the public lands were pledged for the interest and principal of the public debt the great amount of those lands subsequently granted by congress for military bounties 
will it is believed very nearly supply the public demand for several years to come and but little reliance can therefore be placed on that hitherto fruitful source of revenue aside from the permanent annual expenditures which have necessarily largely increased a portion of the public debt amounting to eight million seventy five thousand nine hundred and eighty six dollars and fifty nine cents must be provided for within the next two fiscal years it is most desirable that these accruing demands should be met without resorting to new loans all experience has demonstrated the wisdom and policy of raising a large portion of revenue for the support of government from duties on goods imported the power to lay these duties is unquestionable and its chief object of course is to replenish the treasury but if in doing this an incidental advantage may be gained by encouraging the industry of our own citizens it is our duty to avail ourselves of that advantage a duty laid upon an article which cannot be produced in this country such as tea or coffee adds to the cost of the article and is chiefly or wholly paid by the consumer but a duty laid upon an article which may be produced here stimulates the skill and industry of our own country to produce the same article which is brought into the market in competition with the foreign article and the importer is thus compelled to reduce his price to that at which the domestic article can be sold thereby throwing a part of the duty upon the producer of the foreign article the continuance of this process creates the skill and invites the capital which finally enable us to produce the article much cheaper than it could have been procured from abroad thereby benefiting both the producer and the consumer at home the consequence of this is that the artisan and the agriculturalist are brought together each affords a ready market for the produce of the other the whole country becomes prosperous and the ability to produce every necessary of life renders us independent in war as well as in peace a high tariff can never be permanent it will cause dissatisfaction and will be changed it excludes competition and thereby invites the investment of capital and manufacturers to such excess that when changed it brings distress bankruptcy and ruin upon all who have been misled by its faithless protection what the manufacturer wants is uniformity and permanency that he may feel a confidence that he is not to be ruined by sudden exchanges but to make a tariff uniform and permanent is not only necessary that the laws should not be altered but that the duty should not fluctuate to effect this all duties should be specific wherever the nature of the article is such as to admit of it ad valorem duties fluctuate with the price and offer strong temptations to fraud and perjury specific duties on the contrary are equal and uniform in all ports and at all times and offer a strong inducement to the importer to bring the best article as he pays no more duty upon that than upon one of inferior quality i therefore strongly recommend a modification of the present tariff which has prostrated some of our most important and necessary manufacturers and that specific duties be imposed sufficient to raise the requisite revenue making such discriminations in favor of the industrial pursuits of our own country as to encourage home production without excluding foreign competition it is also important that an unfortunate provision in the present tariff which imposes a much higher duty upon the raw material that enters into our manufactures than upon the manufactured article should be remedied the papers accompanying the report of the secretary of the treasury will disclose frauds attempted upon the revenue in variety and amount so great as to justify the conclusion that it is impossible 
under any system of ad valorem duties levied upon the foreign cost or value of the article to secure an honest observance and an effectual administration of the laws the fraudulent devices to evade the law which have been detected by the vigilance of the appraisers leave no room to doubt that similar impositions not discovered to a large amount have been successfully practised since the enactment of the law now in force this state of things has already had a prejudicial influence upon those engaged in foreign commerce it has a tendency to drive the honest trader from the business of importing and to throw that important branch of employment into the hands of unscrupulous and dishonest men who are alike regardless of law and the obligations of an oath by these means the plain intentions of congress as expressed in the law are daily defeated every motive of policy and duty therefore impels me to ask the earnest attention of congress to this subject if congress should deem it unwise to attempt any important changes in the system of levying duties at this session it will become indispensable to the protection of the revenue that such remedies as in the judgment of congress may mitigate the evils complained of should be at once applied as before stated specific duties would in my opinion afford the most perfect remedy for this evil but if you should not concur in this view then as a partial remedy i beg leave respectfully to recommend that instead of taking the invoice of the article abroad as a means of determining its value here the correctness of which invoice it is in many cases impossible to verify the law be so changed as to require a home valuation or appraisal to be regulated in such manner as to give as far as practicable uniformity in the several ports end of section three section four of state of the union addresses eighteen forty nine to eighteen fifty six this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. State of the Union Address. Millard Fillmore. December 2nd, 1850. Part 2. There being no mint in California, I am informed that the laborers in the mines are compelled to dispose of their gold dust at a large discount. This appears to me to be a heavy and unjust tax upon the labor of those employed in extracting this precious metal, and I doubt not you will be disposed at the earliest period possible to relieve them from it by the establishment of a mint. In the meantime, as an assayer's office is established there, I would respectfully submit for your consideration the propriety of authorizing gold bullion, which has been assayed and stamped to be received in payment of government dues i cannot conceive that the treasury would suffer any loss by such a provision which will at once raise bullion to its par value and thereby save if i am rightly informed many millions of dollars to the laborers which are now paid in brokerage to convert this precious metal into available funds this discount upon their hard earnings is a heavy tax and every effort should be made by the government to relieve them from so great a burden more than three-fourths of our population are engaged in the cultivation of the soil the commercial manufacturing and navigating interests are all to a great extent dependent on the agricultural it is therefore the most important interest of the nation and has a just claim to the fostering care and protection of the government so far as they can be extended consistently with the provisions of the constitution as this cannot be done by the ordinary modes of legislation i respectfully recommend the establishment of an agricultural bureau to be charged with the duty of giving to this leading branch of american industry the encouragement which it so well deserves in view of the immense mineral resources of our country provision should also be made for the employment of a competent mineralogist and chemist 
who should be required under the direction of the head of the bureau to collect specimens of the various minerals of our country and to ascertain by careful analysis their respective elements and properties and their adaptation to useful purposes he should also be required to examine and report upon the qualities of different soils and the manures best calculated to improve their productiveness by publishing the results of such experiments with suitable explanations and by the collection and distribution of rare seeds and plants with instructions as to the best system of cultivation much may be done to promote this great national interest in compliance with the act of congress passed on the twenty third of may eighteen fifty providing among other things for taking the seventh census a superintendent was appointed and all other measures adopted which were deemed necessary to ensure the prompt and faithful performance of that duty the appropriation already made will it is believed be sufficient to defray the whole expense of the work but further legislation may be necessary in regard to the compensation of some of the marshals of the territories it will also be proper to make provision by law at an early day for the publication of such abstracts of the returns as the public interest may require the unprecedented growth of our territories on the pacific in wealth and population and the consequent increase of their social and commercial relations with the atlantic states seem to render it the duty of the government to use all its constitutional power to improve the means of intercourse with them the importance of opening a line of communication the best and most expeditious of which the nature of the country will admit between the valley of the mississippi and the pacific was brought to your notice by my predecessor in his annual message and as the reasons which he presented in favor of the measure still exist in full force i beg leave to call your attention to them and to repeat the recommendations then made by him the uncertainty which exists in regard to the validity of land titles in california is a subject which demands your early consideration large bodies of land in that state are claimed under grants said to have been made by authority of the spanish and mexican governments many of these have not been perfected others have been revoked and some are believed to be fraudulent but until they shall have been judicially investigated they will continue to retard the settlement and improvement of the country i therefore respectfully recommend that provision be made by law for the appointment of commissioners to examine all such claims with a view to their final adjustment i also beg leave to call your attention to the propriety of extending at an early day our system of land laws with such modifications as may be necessary over the state of california and the territories of utah and new mexico the mineral lands of california will of course form an exception to any general system which may be adopted various methods of disposing of them have been suggested i was at first inclined to favor the system of leasing as it seemed to promise the largest revenue to the government and to afford the best security against monopolies but further reflection and our experience in leasing the lead mines and selling lands upon credit have brought my mind to the conclusion that there would be great difficulty in collecting the rents and that the relation of debtor and creditor between the citizens and the government would be attended with many mischievous consequences i therefore recommend that instead of retaining the mineral lands under the permanent control of the government they be divided into small parcels and sold under such restrictions as to quantity and time as will ensure the best price and guard most effectually against combinations of capitalists to obtain monopolies the annexation of texas and the acquisition of california and new mexico have given increased importance to our indian relations the various tribes brought under our jurisdiction by these enlargements of our boundaries are estimated to embrace a population of a hundred and twenty four thousand 
texas and new mexico are surrounded by powerful tribes of indians who are a source of constant terror and annoyance to the inhabitants separating into small predatory bands and always mounted they overrun the country devastating farms destroying crops driving off whole herds of cattle and occasionally murdering the inhabitants or carrying them into captivity the great roads leading into the country are infested with them whereby traveling is rendered extremely dangerous and immigration is almost entirely arrested the mexican frontier which by the eleventh article of the treaty of guadalupe hidalgo we are bound to protect against the indians within our border is exposed to these incursions equally with our own the military force stationed in that country although forming a large proportion of the army is represented as entirely inadequate to our own protection and the fulfillment of our treaty stipulations with mexico the principal deficiency is in cavalry and i recommend that congress should at as early a period as practical provide for the raising of one or more regiments of mounted men for further suggestions on this subject and others connected with our domestic interests and the defense of our frontier i refer you to the reports of the secretary of the interior and of the secretary of war i commend also to your favorable consideration the suggestion contained in the last mentioned report and in the letter of the general-in-chief relative to the establishment of an asylum for the relief of disabled and destitute soldiers this subject appeals so strongly to your sympathies that it would be superfluous in me to say anything more than barely to express my cordial approbation of the proposed object the navy continues to give protection to our commerce and other national interests in the different quarters of the globe and with the exception of a single steamer on the northern lakes the vessels in commission are distributed in six different squadrons the report of the head of that department will exhibit the services of these squadrons and of the several vessels employed in each during the past year it is a source of gratification that while they have been constantly prepared for any hostile emergency they have everywhere met with the respect and courtesy do as well to the dignity as to the peaceful dispositions and just purposes of the nation the two brigantines accepted by the government from a generous citizen of new york and placed under the command of an officer of the navy to proceed to the arctic seas in quest of the british commander sir john franklin and his companions in compliance with the act of congress approved in may last had when last heard from penetrated into a high northern latitude but the success of this noble and humane enterprise is yet uncertain i invite your attention to the view of our present naval establishment and resources presented in the report of the secretary of the navy and the suggestions therein made for its improvement together with the naval policy recommended for the security of our pacific coast and the protection and extension of our commerce with eastern asia our facilities for a larger participation in the trade of the east by means of our recent settlements on the shores of the pacific are too obvious to be overlooked or disregarded the questions in relation to rank in the army and navy and relative rank between officers of the two branches of the service presented to the executive by certain resolutions of the house of representatives at the last session of congress have been submitted to a board of officers in each branch of the service and their report may be expected at an early day i also earnestly recommend the enactment of a law authorizing officers of the army and navy to be retired from the service when incompetent for its vigorous and active duties taking care to make suitable provision for those who have faithfully served their country and awarding distinctions by retaining in appropriate commands those who have been particularly conspicuous for gallantry and good conduct while the obligation of the country to maintain and honor 
those who to the exclusion of other pursuits have devoted themselves to its arduous service is acknowledged this obligation should not be permitted to interfere with the efficiency of the service itself i am gratified in being able to state that the estimates of expenditure for the navy in the ensuing year are less by more than one million dollars than those of the present excepting the appropriation which may become necessary for the construction of a dock on the coast of the pacific propositions for which are now being considered and on which a special report may be expected early in your present session there is evident justness in the suggestion of the same report that appropriations for the naval service proper should be separated from those for fixed and permanent objects such as building docks and navy yards and the fixtures attached and from the extraordinary objects under the care of the department which however important are not essentially naval a revision of the code for the government of the navy seems to require the immediate consideration of congress its system of crimes and punishments had undergone no change for half a century until the last session though its defects have been often and ably pointed out and the abolition of a particular species of corporal punishment which then took place without providing any substitute has left the service in a state of defectiveness which calls for prompt correction i therefore recommend that the whole subject be revised without delay and such a system established for the enforcement of discipline as shall be at once humane and effectual the accompanying report of the postmaster general presents a satisfactory view of the operations and condition of that department at the close of the last fiscal year the length of the inland mail routes in the united states not embracing the service in oregon and california was one hundred and seventy eight thousand six hundred and seventy two miles the annual transportation therein forty six million five hundred and forty one thousand four hundred and twenty three miles and the annual cost of such transportation two million seven hundred and twenty four thousand four hundred and twenty six dollars the increase of the annual transportation over that of the preceding year was three million nine hundred and ninety seven thousand three hundred and fifty four miles and the increase in cost was three hundred and forty two thousand four hundred and forty dollars the number of post offices in the united states on the first day of july last was eighteen thousand four hundred and seventeen being an increase of one thousand six hundred and seventy during the preceding year the gross revenues of the department for the fiscal year ending june thirtieth eighteen fifty amounted to five million five hundred and fifty two thousand nine hundred and seventy one dollars and forty eight cents including the annual appropriation of two hundred thousand dollars for the frank matter of the departments and excluding the foreign postages collected for and payable to the british government the expenditures for the same period were five million two hundred and twelve thousand nine hundred and fifty three dollars and forty three cents leaving a balance of revenue over expenditures of three hundred and forty thousand eighteen dollars and five cents I am happy to find that the fiscal condition of the department is such as to justify the postmaster general in recommending the reduction of our inland letter postage to three cents the single letter when prepaid and five cents when not prepaid he also recommends that the prepaid rate shall be reduced to two cents whenever the revenues of the department after the reduction shall exceed its expenditures by more than five per cent for two consecutive years that the postage upon california and other letters sent by our ocean steamers shall be much reduced and that the rates of postage on newspapers pamphlets periodicals and other printed matter shall be modified and some reduction thereon made it cannot be doubted that the proposed reductions will for the present diminish the revenues of the department it is believed that the deficiency after the surplus already accumulated shall be exhausted may be almost wholly met 
either by abolishing the existing privileges of sending free matter through the mails or by paying out of the treasury to the post office department a sum equivalent to the postage of which it is deprived by such privileges the last is supposed to be the preferable mode and will if not entirely so nearly supply that deficiency as to make any further appropriation that may be found necessary so inconsiderable as to form no obstacle to the proposed reductions i entertain no doubt of the authority of congress to make appropriations for leading objects in that class of public works comprising what are usually called works of internal improvement this authority i suppose to be derived chiefly from the power of regulating commerce with foreign nations and among the states and the power of laying and collecting imposts where commerce is to be carried on and imposts collected there must be ports and harbors as well as wharves and custom houses if ships laden with valuable cargoes approach the shore or sail along the coast lighthouses are necessary at suitable points for the protection of life and property other facilities and securities for commerce and navigation are hardly less important and those clauses of the constitution therefore to which i have referred have received from the origin of the government a liberal and beneficial construction not only have lighthouses buoys and beacons been established and floating lights maintained but harbors have been cleared and improved piers constructed and even breakwaters for the safety of shipping and sea walls to protect harbors from being filled up and rendered useless by the action of the ocean have been erected at very great expense and this construction of the constitution appears the more reasonable from the consideration that if these works of such evident importance and utility are not to be accomplished by congress they cannot be accomplished at all by the adoption of the constitution the several states voluntarily parted with the power of collecting duties of imposts in their own ports and it is not to be expected that they should raise money by internal taxation direct or indirect for the benefit of that commerce the revenues derived from which do not either in whole or in part go into their own treasuries nor do i perceive any difference between the power of congress to make appropriations for objects of this kind on the ocean and the power to make appropriations for similar objects on lakes and rivers wherever they are large enough to bear on their waters an extensive traffic the magnificent mississippi and its tributaries and the vast lakes of the north and northwest appear to me to fall within the exercise of the power as justly and as clearly as the ocean and the gulf of mexico it is a mistake to regard expenditures judiciously made for these objects as expenditures for local purposes the position or site of the work is necessarily local but its utility is general a ship canal around the falls of st mary of less than a mile in length though local in its construction would yet be national in its purpose and its benefits as it would remove the only obstruction to a navigation of more than a thousand miles affecting several states as well as our commercial relations with canada so too the breakwater at the mouth of the delaware is erected not for the exclusive benefit of the states bordering on the bay and river of that name but for that of the whole coastwise navigation of the united states and to a considerable extent also of foreign commerce if a ship be lost on the bar at the entrance of a southern port for want of sufficient depth of water it is very likely to be a northern ship if a steamboat be sunk in any part of the mississippi on account of its channel not having been properly cleared of obstructions it may be a boat belonging to either of eight or ten states i may add as somewhat remarkable that among all the thirty-one states there is none that is not to a greater or a less extent bounded on the ocean or the gulf of mexico or one of the great lakes or some navigable river in fulfilling our constitutional duties fellow-citizens 
on this subject as in carrying into effect all other powers conferred by the constitution we should consider ourselves as deliberating and acting for one and the same country and bear constantly in mind that our regard and our duty are due not to a particular part only but to the whole i therefore recommend that appropriations be made for completing such works as have been already begun and for commencing such others as may seem to the wisdom of congress to be of public and general importance the difficulties and delays incident to the settlement of private claims by congress amount in many cases to a denial of justice there is reason to apprehend that many unfortunate creditors of the government have thereby been unavoidably ruined congress has so much business of a public character that it is impossible it should give much attention to mere private claims and their accumulation is now so great that many claimants must despair of ever being able to obtain a hearing it may well be doubted whether congress from the nature of its organization is properly constituted to decide upon such cases it is impossible that each member should examine the merits of every claim on which he is compelled to vote and it is preposterous to ask a judge to decide a case which he has never heard such decisions may and frequently must do injustice either to the claimant or to the government and i perceive no better remedy for this growing evil than the establishment of some tribunal to adjudicate upon such claims i beg leave therefore most respectfully to recommend that provision be made by law for the appointment of a commission to settle all private claims against the united states and as an ex parte hearing must in all contested cases be very unsatisfactory i also recommend the appointment of a solicitor whose duty it shall be to represent the government before such commission and protect it against all illegal fraudulent or unjust claims which may be presented for their adjudication this district which has neither voice nor vote in your deliberations looks to you for protection and aid and i commend all it wants to your favorable consideration with a full confidence that you will meet them not only with justice but with liberality it should be borne in mind that in this city laid out by washington and consecrated by his name is located the capital of our nation the emblem of our union and the symbol of our greatness here also are situated all the public buildings necessary for the use of government and all these are exempt from taxation it should be the pride of americans to render this place attractive to the people of the whole republic and convenient and safe for the transaction of the public business and the preservation of the public records the government should therefore bear a liberal proportion of the burdens of all necessary and useful improvements and as nothing could contribute more to the health comfort and safety of the city and the security of the public buildings and records than an abundant supply of pure water i respectfully recommend that you make such provisions for obtaining the same as in your wisdom you may deem proper the act passed at your last session making certain propositions to texas for settling the disputed boundary between that state and the territory of new mexico was immediately on its passage transmitted by express to the governor of texas to be laid by him before the general assembly for its agreement thereto its receipt was duly acknowledged but no official information has yet been received of the action of the general assembly thereon it may however be very soon expected as by the terms of the propositions submitted that they were to have been acted upon on or before the first day of the present month 
it was hardly to have been expected that the series of measures passed at your last session with the view of healing the sectional differences which had sprung from the slavery and territorial questions should at once have realized their beneficent purpose all mutual concession in the nature of a compromise must necessarily be unwelcome to men of extreme opinions and though without such concessions our constitution could not have been formed and cannot be permanently sustained yet we have seen them made the subject of bitter controversy in both sections of the republic it required many months of discussion and deliberation to secure the concurrence of a majority of congress in their favor it would be strange if they had been received with immediate approbation by people and states prejudiced and heated by the exciting controversies of their representatives i believe those measures to have been required by the circumstances and condition of the country i believe they were necessary to allay asperities and animosities that were rapidly alienating one section of the country from another and destroying those fraternal sentiments which are the strongest supports of the constitution they were adopted in the spirit of conciliation and for the purpose of conciliation i believe that a great majority of our fellow citizens sympathize in that spirit and that purpose and in the main approve and are prepared in all respects to sustain these enactments i cannot doubt that the american people bound together by kindred blood and common traditions still cherish a paramount regard for the union of their fathers and that they are ready to rebuke any attempt to violate its integrity to disturb the compromises on which it is based or to resist the laws which have been enacted under its authority the series of measures to which i have alluded are regarded by me as a settlement in principle and substance a final settlement of the dangerous and exciting subjects which they embraced most of these subjects indeed are beyond your reach as the legislation which disposed of them was in its character final and irrevocable it may be presumed from the opposition which they all encountered that none of those measures was free from imperfections but in their mutual dependence and connection they formed a system of compromise the most conciliatory and best for the entire country that could be obtained from conflicting sectional interests and opinions for this reason i recommend your adherence to the adjustment established by those measures until time and experience shall demonstrate the necessity of further legislation to guard against evasion or abuse by that adjustment we have been rescued from the wide and boundless agitation that surround us and have a firm distinct and legal ground to rest upon and the occasion i trust will justify me in exhorting my countrymen to rally upon and maintain that ground as the best if not the only means of restoring peace and quiet to the country and maintaining inviolate the integrity of the union and now fellow citizens i cannot bring this communication to a close without invoking you to join me in humble and devout thanks to the great ruler of nations for the multiplied blessings which he has graciously bestowed upon us his hand so often visible in our preservation has stayed the pestilence saved us from foreign wars and domestic disturbances and scattered plenty throughout the land our liberties religions and civil have been maintained the fountains of knowledge have all been kept open and means of happiness widely spread and generally enjoyed greater than have fallen to the lot of any other nation and while deeply penetrated with gratitude for the past let us hope that his all-wise providence will so guide our counsels as that they shall result in giving satisfaction to our constituents securing the peace of the country and adding new strength to the united government under which we live 
Millard Fillmore, 1850. End of section 4.